What is up everyone, welcome back. So what I have for you today is a pretty short video, more of a general tip that I have for a really good kind of hack to understand all these different confusing formulas that are coming at you in your journey through data science. So we'll start with the example, and then we'll talk about what the overall hack is, and then we'll look at a couple more examples to round out the video. And so the first example is, pretend it's your first time learning about the F1 score. Maybe it actually will be for this video. The F1 score is a way in data science to combine the metrics of precision and recall into a single number that somehow is supposed to encompass both. And it's given by the F1 score is a function of precision and recall in some kind of classification problem is equal to two times the product of precision and recall divided by the sum of precision and recall. Now, it looks simple enough, but also kind of complicated and I'm not really sure where this form is coming from or what the goal of this form is, why did whoever engineer it engineer it to look like this, it's a little bit hard to understand. Now counterintuitively, to understand this, one of the best, one of the most productive things we can do is actually fall back on our calculus and take the derivative of this mystery function with respect to all of its arguments. So for the sake of this video, and because for the sake of this specific case, it doesn't matter if we do precision or recall, you'll notice it's symmetric with both. So we'll just take the derivative of this F1 score with respect to precision. It's pretty easy, we fall back on our quotient rule of derivatives, however back you learn that. So it's the bottom times the derivative of the top with respect to P minus the top times the derivative of the bottom with respect to P all divided by the denominator or the bottom squared. And it actually simplifies quite nicely to look like this form right here. Now the exact form, we don't need to read too much into it. What we should look into with this form is how does this form, this derivative that we just calculated, respond to changes in precision? So if I draw this formula as a plot basically right here, precision is a number that's allowed to range between zero in the weakest precision to one for the best precision. And if I plot out this curve here, as precision gets bigger and bigger and bigger, you're gonna notice two things. First, this is always positive because it's two, a positive number, times something squared, which is always a positive number. So that's observation number one, is that this derivative is always positive. And observation number two is because precision only occurs in the denominator. As we get higher and higher and higher and higher precisions, this denominator is gonna get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. So these are the two things we learned. How do these two mathematical findings translate into helping us more fully understand what this original form of F1 score was actually trying to capture? Well, that first finding, which is that the derivative of F1 score with respect to precision or with respect to recall for that matter, is always greater than zero, is always positive. What that means is no matter what the precision is, for an incremental increase in precision of one extra delta unit, we're always going to get an incremental increase in F1 score. F1 score is always going to increase for an increase in precision. And that was a little bit tricky to see with the original formula because precision occurs in both the numerator and the denominator here. So it's a little bit to just say, looking at that, if I increase precision, well, that's gonna make the numerator go up, but it's also gonna make the denominator go up. So is that gonna have an overall positive impact on F1 score always, or is it sometimes positive, sometimes negative? By taking this very simple derivative, we found that no, it is always a positive effect. And the second part of that story, maybe the more important part of that story, is that even though you're going to be increasing F1 score as your precision goes up, the rate of that increase is going down. It starts rather high, so if you have a precision of zero, you get a lot of points, you get a lot of increase in F1 score if you increase your precision by just a little bit. What that's saying in human terms is that your precision is trash right now. If you're able to get it from trash to something slightly better, I'm gonna give you a lot of gains in your F1 score. However, if your precision is already really high at like 0.9 or 0.95, then that same incremental increase in precision is gonna give you a positive reward, as we saw with the first observation. But that incremental increase, that marginal reward, is gonna be smaller and smaller and smaller. And so hopefully this starts getting your gears turning about, I had no idea what this formula was trying to tell me, why it was engineered this way, why did the person who designed it design it to look like this? But by simply just taking the derivative, which didn't take us much time at all, and then observing properties of that derivative, that actually counterintuitively sheds light on the original function itself. And I say counterintuitively here because it seems like taking a derivative is kind of complicating the whole thing. This form looks a little bit complex, but it does simplify very nicely, as you'll see with our other examples today. 
and it really does shed light on why the function was engineered the way it was. So that gets us into the overall idea for today. And the idea is that anytime you have a mystery function, some kind of unknown function that is really stumping you, going through the following steps, in my experience, can be super helpful for you to gain a very important fundamental understanding of data science. So you have your unknown formula. It's some function of some arguments, x, y, and z. In the previous case, it was the F1 score, and it was a function of precision and recall, but really this can work for any function of any number of arguments. What you're going to do is take the gradient, take the derivative of that function with respect to all of its arguments. And now this is not always going to be easy. It's going to be mathematically easy for the cases we'll look at today. And you'll find that very often, more often than you would expect, it does simplify mathematically very well. But in many cases, it will not. So these gradients can either be done on paper using a marker and pencil, or it can be done in code more computationally. It doesn't really matter. So don't let a scary looking form stop you from using this strategy. So once you take the gradients, you're going to look at the shape, the overall trend of these gradients, and that's going to let us better understand the original function itself. And so the overall philosophy here is that I don't know what this is or what it's trying to do with its arguments. Let me see how it responds to changes in those arguments. And by looking at how it responds to changes in those arguments, I understand better what the overall goal of the original thing was to begin with. And so let's do a couple more examples to really showcase the power of this philosophy. So for this next example, we'll throw it way back to when you first started learning statistics, you probably learned right after learning about the mean of a set of numbers, you probably learned about the variance of a set of numbers x1, x2, all the way to xn. And so this formula should look very familiar to you. It's the variance of a set of n numbers. It's simply the sum of the squared deviations of those numbers from their mean, all divided by the number of numbers that there are n. And so we're going to do the same thing. We're going to take the derivative of this variance with respect to just arbitrarily the first argument, x1. So what we're asking here is that if I increase x1 by an incremental unit, what change is that going to have on the variance? So I won't go through all of it. It's a little bit of using our rules of powers here. You see we bring the power down in a lot of cases here. So I trust that you can come up with this form yourself. But eventually we work out the math and we get that the derivative of the variance with respect to some arbitrary one of these numbers here, just say x1, is going to be 2 times x1 minus mu, mu being the mean of this set of numbers all divided by the number of numbers that there are. And so the next thing we'll do is go ahead and plot this function, this function of x1 in this plot right here, and stare at that and see what that implies for the nature of the variance and the nature of the change of the variance with respect to changing any of our inputs to the variance. So this is a very simple linear function. Honestly, if we look back at it right here, we see that it is 2 over n times x1 minus the mean of the set of numbers. What that means is that if I plug in the mean into x1, then I'm going to get 0. So the gradient, I use this upside down triangle for the gradient in case you're unfamiliar with that notation. But the gradient is going to be exactly 0. There's no change if one of these numbers is exactly equal to the mean of all of the numbers. And that intuitively makes sense because the variance is measuring the average deviation from the mean. So if you have one of your arguments exactly equal to the mean, then it's not really contributing to that deviation at all because it's exactly where the mean is. So that's what this first line is saying. The second two lines are the more interesting ones, which say that if your number is lower than the mean, so you can see that graphically here, if your number is lower than the mean, then what is the effect on the variance of increasing that number? Well, increasing that number in this case would bring it closer and closer to the mean, which means that the variance is going down because you're bringing one of the arguments closer to the others. And that explains why the derivative here is negative. That's why the variance would go down in that case. This other case is basically the exact opposite. If some argument is higher than the mean, you can see that here, then having an incremental increase in that argument is now going to pull it further from the mean of all of your arguments, which is going to cause your variance to go up. And so now we understand the variance a lot better, even if the variance is something we learned 5 or 10 or 20 years ago. We now understand that the impact of varying any of your arguments into the variance is going to have a linear relationship with the rate of change of the overall variance with respect to the change in that argument. So this helps us even understand things that we thought we knew way back when, just sheds another layer of explanation on top of it.
And our final example today is going to be hearkening to, for example, logistic regressions, one of the very first machine learning models we use. And in logistic regression, we're basically trying to model the probability of a positive class as some argument of the input feature x. Here we're just using a single input feature. And that's modeled by the sigmoid function, which is 1 over 1 plus e to the power of negative that argument. And so now we wonder, hmm, what is the impact of an incremental increase of my argument, of my feature x, on that probability? And so we can go ahead and do the exact same thing. Take the derivative of this probability, which just looking at it, it does look kind of cool and simple, but also kind of complicated. It's kind of hard for me to just stare at this and say, what is the impact on the probability going to be if I increase my x? Does it depend on other things, like what the probability is to begin with? It's kind of hard to tell. So if we take the derivative, here we apply the quotient rule of derivatives again. We actually simplify very, very, very nicely to the derivative of the probability with respect to that feature is going to be the probability itself times 1 minus the probability itself. And if I go ahead and plot that out on this chart, you see that it's this inverse parabola where at 0 and 1, that derivative is exactly equal to 0. And at 1 half, when that probability is 1 half, then our derivative is exactly at its maximum. And so what story is that trying to tell? The story that's trying to tell, we learn from doing this derivative exercise, let me put this on this side of the piece of paper, what we learn is that if the probability for some given x is already very low, so very close to 0, or very high, so very close to 1, to begin with, then moving that x, increasing that argument, that feature x by a little bit, is going to have little to no effect. That's what it's saying on the ends of this distribution. The derivative of this probability with respect to changing that argument, that feature x, is going to have very little effect. On the other hand, if your probability is already around the 50% mark, which means that you're very close to equally uncertain about whether it's in the positive class or whether it's in the negative class, that's what it means for your predicted probability to be around 50%, then it's exactly there that changing your argument x, changing your feature x by a little bit, is going to have the biggest effect. And this whole story does kind of make sense, because if you think about trying to predict the probability something's going to happen based on some feature x, if your prediction of that probability is already really close to impossible, or already really close to extremely likely, then changing your input feature by a little bit is not going to change your mind that much. It's not like you're going to go from 0 to 0 0.25 all of a sudden. They're very sticky at the ends, is what this story is telling us, according to this sigmoid form. However, if you have a 50-50 chance here, and your x moves by a little bit, which means you get a little bit of evidence one way or the other, then that is going to very significantly impact what your probability is going to be. That is going to sway you very far in one direction or the other. So it's very volatile in the middle and very sticky on the ends, which again is not something I can just stare at this original formula that someone just handed to me and tell you, but is something that I can very clearly and graphically explain to you once I take the derivative, as counterintuitive as it might sound to take the derivative of something to understand that thing better. And so what I would encourage you to do is just try this for yourself. In some cases, you'll find that things work out really well, the math works out really well. In other cases, you might run into more roadblocks, and you might have to turn to computational gradients instead of taking them analytically like this. So for example, try it with very popular data science formulas, like the KL divergence. How does the KL divergence change if you were to edit those distributions that are underlying the KL distribution by just a little bit? How does TF-IDF, this very popular metric in natural language processing, change? if you edit TF by just a little bit, or if you edit IDF by just a little bit. These are very, very enlightening things in my experience. And I found that just doing this exercise on a brand new formula someone hands me, or even an existing formula that I thought I've understood for years, has really helped me build that foundation of my data science knowledge, or reinforce that foundation of my data science knowledge way more than I thought would have been possible. So I really encourage you to do this exercise for yourself, even with things you thought you knew for years. So hopefully this video is kind of interesting for you all. Thank you for sticking around till now. Please like and subscribe for more videos just like this. I'll see all you wonderful people next time.